Bulletproof Radio, a state of high performance. You're listening to Bulletproof Radio with Dave Asprey. Today's episode is filmed on location at the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine, which is where 27,000 physicians, well, fewer than that show up, but 27,000 physicians are members uh, of a group that's been working for 26 years to define aging as something that we can attack and change and reduce and maybe even reverse uh, medically and with lifestyle. And it's given me the opportunity to see many great friends and to make some new ones and to meet people who've done decades of work to change the world. And today's guest is one of those gentlemen. He is a neurosurgeon, 78 years old, who is very, very well known uh, because he's the guy who created a test for that 13 million people have taken to understand the impact of impacts on your brain. So he studied traumatic brain injury. He's the first neurosurgeon in the NFL. And a uh, name you might have heard if you have ever watched uh, the movie Concussion, although the character in Concussion has very little to do with the real Dr. Joseph Maroon. Dr. Maroon, welcome to Bulletproof Radio. David, it's a pleasure being here and a pleasure meeting you for all of your phenomenal accomplishments and what you've done to uh, assist with anti-aging programs. Uh, coming from you, that's a, a huge compliment. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well earned. Now, anytime uh, you get a chance to meet a, a neurosurgeon who's practiced for, for decades and decades, it, it means that they've had the chance to accumulate some wisdom and to see this incredible sea change that's happened in a field. And you'll see that in almost anyone who's practiced medicine for many decades. Go, well, you know, here's what we did in the 60s. It was a little bit different than what we do in the 70s. And they have this long view of the evolution of a field. And the first thing I'd like to know, uh, Dr. Maroon, is uh, what's changed since you started looking at the brain? Well, in terms of concussion, I think you're exactly right. The most important thing is perspective as it is in anything in life. And I've had the good fortune to have perspective from the 80s to the 90s to the present day in terms of what's, what's evolved. And there's been a huge evolution from how many fingers can you count uh, and a little ammonium chloride or smelling salts and then back into whatever the game might be, rugby, football or whatever due to the observations of the potential long-term effects of concussions, there's been a major, major sea change of rules at every level, from the NFL to Pop Warner to USA Today Football, with the exclusive purpose of providing a safe opportunity for kids at all levels, so to speak, to participate in a phenomenal game that incredible human life lessons are learned. General MacArthur said it very well. He said he had this, this plaque placed on the playing fields facing uh, the, the, the playing fields at West Point. And it said, on the fields of friendly strife are sown the seeds that on other days and on other fields will lead to victory. And that's so true. Teamwork, getting up when you're when you don't want to get up, uh, going through some degree of pain, are all lessons learned. So the the whole goal of the rules changes is to provide safety. And quite frankly, uh, particularly at the youth level, it's never been safer. Uh, and we're looking at other sports. Girls' soccer, we know now, has an incidence of of uh, concussions equivalent to male football players. Wow. So it's a big problem. It's being addressed as best as possible without completely eliminating the, the, the sport and the lessons learned on the fields of friendly strife. You're saying this based on 13 million uh, data points, or at least more than, more than that probably, because you actually looked at the effects of traumatic brain injury on people. How did you develop that body of research that became the standard in, in the field? Well, um, very early on, uh, Coach Chuck Knoll, who was the coach of the Pittsburgh Steelers for many years and four Super Bowl uh, championships, I told him that his star quarterback, 
couldn't play against the Dallas Cowboys the following week. And he said, why not? He said, because I said, because he's had a concussion. And the guidelines at that time said, if you had a concussion, you had to stay out a minimum of two weeks. He said, well, who wrote the guidelines? What evidence-based knowledge did you use to put those together? He was very challenging. And he said, if you want me to keep somebody out of playing football, I want objective data. And uh, somewhat chagrined, but he was correct. I collaborated with a neuropsychologist, Mark Lovell, and we came up with a test subsequently called IMPACT, which is a neurocognitive test that assesses reaction time to one one hundredth of a second memory, the ability to process information. And I went back and I said, well, now we have to baseline the whole team, which was a little resistance Mm -hmm. doing neuropsychological tests on on a professional football team. However, we did do that. He acquiesced and encouraged it. And subsequently, it's become the, the, the standard with every major sports organization, 12,000 high schools, as to get a baseline before you return to a contact sport with a neurocognitive test as one piece of information to make that decision. It's kind of funny. We used to say years ago oh you know you've had your bell rung yeah or these, these other things oh you know get up and walk it off uh, sort of things and i had a a couple pretty substantial tbis over the last two years uh, one of them had a bleed uh, i had amnesia for a week uh, light sensitivity nausea uh, couldn't play go fish with my kids and i'm i'm a pretty smart guy and it was really weird because it, it happened I, I had these these symptoms and it was just wrecked the time before that, I, I hit my head really hard. I had a, actually, I think I had to bleed that time, but I'd, amnesia, I can't remember the order of operations but after it happened. That it was, It's not real amnesia like from the movies, but enough that it's all jumbled when I try to remember it. But I remember the day after that, I recorded five podcasts in a row. And recording five podcasts in a day is a Herculean feat. I almost never do that, but it just lined up with my calendar. And at the end of the day, I said, I'm a little tired. And then I woke up the next day and I, I couldn't count my fingers. Like I was completely zombified. And then I swore a lot for uh, for a month or two and ended up having to do some neurofeedback as well as specific nutritional protocols to put my brain back together again. And thank goodness I have access to hyperbaric and everything else. So I recovered in stem cells in my brain, whatever. I recovered faster and better than I'm supposed to. But for people who've never had a TBI, I can tell you, I went from I'm kicking ass to, I can't play go fish, right? And because I'm, I'm swearing at everybody. Now, what's your explanation for someone? So say, what would you tell a family member of someone who has their first concussion? What would you tell them to expect? How would you describe what it's like? First, first of all, what you're describing is terrifying. Yeah. There's no question about it. You know, is this going to be permanent? Is it long lasting? Fortunately, 90% of concussions clear within a week, maybe two weeks. Eight to 10% of patients will develop what's called the post-concussion syndrome. And this can be associated with memory impairment, with mood disturbances, sleep disturbances, and uh, can really be very debilitating. What about depression? Is that in there as well? Yes, absolutely. Uh, Mickey Collins, who's the head of the concussion clinic at the University of Pittsburgh, Uh, we'll see in that clinic close to 10,000 new patients a year with concussions from all kinds. And they have an absolutely huge database. And he has actually, you know, we used to think that you didn't have a concussion unless you lost consciousness. Right. We now know that 90% of concussions are not associated with loss of consciousness. Only 10% are. And that uh, he has subdivided the concussive syndrome into several separate segments. For instance, one of migraine, some patients just develop migraine headaches following a concussion. Yep. Others or uh, uh, vestibulo-ocular, unbalance, unsteadiness, feeling foggy. Mm -hmm. Another is cervical cephalgia, uh, pain in the neck, head, Another is somatic with headaches, nausea, vomiting. The, the, so each of these can be subcharacterized, and then there's a tremendous overlap. Right. Each of these can. There are specific protocols for dealing with each, 
And uh, before, we used to think that we would cocoon patients and other put them in a dark room, no stimulation. You clearly overdid it in terms of taxing your brain, your oh, mental yeah. prowess the next day. We, we advise rest for the first few days to let the brain recover. Uh, and, and then very specific types of exercises and gradually increase with aerobic activity, which we used to say none at all for a week or two. The consensus now is that's not the best form of therapy. And, and we can go on and on about what is, what, you know, what does help. Uh, I'm a proponent of uh, omega-3 fatty acids and natural anti-inflammatories. We've written papers on neuroinflammation as the underlying genesis of many of the syndromes and symptoms that occur. So, Neuroinflammation is an interesting topic because with my history of having high levels of toxic mold in my house, uh, having high levels of chronic stress, <laughs> uh, and uh, probably mercury levels uh, earlier in life, I certainly had some higher mercury levels, these are all things, autoimmunity, uh, that trigger uh, chronic inflammation, including neuroinflammation, even things like ADHD and autism and Asperger's syndrome. And Asperger certainly runs in my family, and uh, I, I certainly was somewhere on the spectrum when I was younger, at least. And those are all tied together with neurons and, and glial cells, parts of the brain getting inflamed. And concussion is also tied together. What's the difference between what happens in the brain with a concussion and this other lifestyle-based inflammation? Uh, complex question. Uh, I mean, a complex answer to a straightforward question. You know, what is neuroinflammation? Uh, let's just go back to concussion for just a second. Yeah. What happens to the brain? And you ask this when you get traumatized, when the brain gets sloshed around in the, inside the cranium, so to speak. Uh, what happens is there, it, 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 the analogy is getting a splinter under your finger. What happens when you get a splinter under your finger? The natural immune response, it gets red hot, tender, and swollen. Why? Because various white blood cells go to the site, release cytokines, chemokines, proteases in a protective way, the body's protective mechanism. The same thing happens in the brain with trauma, microglial cells, which are the white blood cell protectors of the, of the central nervous system, go to the area of trauma and then also release cytokines, chemokines, proteases, which initially cause an inflammatory response, just like your finger. Uh, and then secondarily, just like your finger, the body sends various growth factors, healing factors, anti-inflammatory agents, to heal it, the same thing happens with the, brain, with the brain. In trauma, if you go back to a football game or a soccer game or a rugby game like you played uh, beforehand, then it's like a dry, a dry bush caught on fire in a dry forest. There's a cascading problem with uh, cytotoxicity. And also there's another chemical called glutamate that's yeah. released. So it's an immunoexcitotoxic phenomena. So getting back to heavy metal poisoning, getting back to, to Alzheimer's disease, yeah. getting back to, which is called type three diabetes, as you know. Mm -hmm. What happens in the brain to elicit the deposition of beta amyloid and neurofibrillary tangles, which are the hallmarks of neurodegenerative disease in the brain. Underlying is the microglia have a major response in this role. And so what strategies are available for turning off the microglia or helping to heal in terms of BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic factor, the so-called miracle grow of the brain, yes. which as you know, is greatly facilitated with ketone bodies. Oh yeah. <laughs> Go bulletproof coffee. <laughs> <laughs> the, the commonality of inflammation with so many diseases of aging from Alzheimer's, cardiac disease, arthritis, uh, you name it. And this, the essence of many of them 
the original substrate is inflammation. So right. whatever we can do dietary wise, ex- exercise wise, and reducing and, and environmental factors, too much alcohol, smoking, uh, and controlling stress are all epigenetic factors that lead to health. If the opposite, a bad diet, no exercise, toxins in our environment, and uncontrollable stress, as we know, stress increases cortisol. What's cortisol do to the brain? It's toxic. It literally kills cells in the hippocampus. If it's too high, if it's too low. If it's too high. But if it's too low, your hippocampus isn't going to like it either because you have no blood pressure. Exactly. So a lot of people are so concerned about cortisol, cortisol, they drive it low, and then they don't like their life either. So. Okay. So I, I gave a talk actually this morning at this conference, and uh, you know, it, it the title of it was the connectome. Uh, actually, is rewiring your brain. Oh, beautiful! The connectome, neuroepigenetics, and neuroplasticity. All right, I have to stop you right there. So if you're listening to the show and you hear that title and you don't get all excited about it, that's because you're just not as cool as me. Because when I <laughs> when I hear that title, I'm just like, yeah! But I understand if you're not, we're going to translate that for you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And and it, it goes to the heart of who we are. Yeah. You know, if, and, and that's a, actually, it's a good question. If I asked Dave, who are you? An appropriate answer would be, I am my connectome. Define the connectome. So the connectome is literally the wiring structure of our brain. We have 100 billion neurons, nerve cells. We have over 100 trillion synaptic connections of those nerve cells. And they come together in fiber tracks. And the fiber tracks, several hundred thousands of these, connect the different parts of the brain. That is your connectome. The connectome is the wiring diagram, the wiring structure of the brain. And there's a a so-called the connectome project, which is a consortium of uh, MGH, Harvard, uh, USC, and St. Louis University that are using MRIs, thousands and thousands of patients, and incredibly complex algorithms to image brains. And literally now we can see the tracks of the brain. We can see the fiber tracks. More importantly, we can see where these tracks are broken. When you had your concussion, if you had a high definition fiber tractography examination, we might've seen some breaks in some of those fibers at the time with the subsequent neuroinflammatory response around those breaks. So, you know, it's, uh, we, can, we can get, I don't wanna get off into the woods here, into the weeds, but uh, what we're learning in, the, in neuroanatomy, neurochemistry, neurophysiology, uh, and imaging of the brain simply is, it blows your mind away now. I mean, I've been in this for quite a few years, and what I saw initially, I mean, we, we talk about localization, cortical localization, in, initially, if you couldn't speak, it was related. There was a, there was a physician, Paul Broca, in the uh, late 1800s, yeah. who had a patient whose, whose name was Tan because that was the only word he could say is Tan, Tan, no matter what the question, Tan. And when he died, he looked at the brain in the left frontal cortex, there was a large lesion mm. that he correlated and said, hmm, this area Resp- corresponds to speech. Wernicke, another physician, looked in the posterior temporal lobe with a fellow who couldn't understand anything. So yeah. we, we correlated brain localization with areas neuropathologically in the brain. Now we know the connectome gives us a whole new understanding of schizophrenia, ADHD, uh, what happens with abuse of a kid as a child, what happens intrauterine in terms of the mother who smokes marijuana excessively, what does this do to the child's wiring mechanism in terms of addiction, the alcoholic mother who transmits these genes epigenetically to the child to wire the brain in a way that this kid 
doesn't really have a great chance. Wow. So all of these things are fascinating to me. And they're now visible, whereas before we yes. sort of thought that yeah. there were wives' tales because we had the correlation, but now you can actually see it on a computer screen. Yeah. Uh, so, so the world is, is changing dramatically. And you got into something uh, earlier. You said one of, the, one of the things that happens or can happen when you get hit in the head is depression. Yes. But about 50% of your life ago, uh, and I know this because you wrote about it in your book called Square One, uh, which is uh, not a neuroscience book, uh, but you wrote about how at, at 41, you, as you put it, went straight into the darkness of depression. And you dealt with that as a neuroscientist. And now, you know, almost 40 years later, you wrote uh, Square One, A Simple Guide to a Balanced Life, sort of saying, well, here's, here's what you've got to do based on all of my neuroscience and having been there myself. What made you depressed? And how did you handle depression as a trained neuroscientist? That's an, I, I, obviously a, a very, very good question, thoughtful question. And I, Dave, when I finished medical school, went to residency, went to practice, um, I attained the ultimate in success. I had it all. Yeah. I had a title. I was chief of neurosurgery at a hospital. Uh, I had enough financial resources to live decently. Uh, I had a good reputation and uh, working with professional teams and then one day, my father died, family broke up, and I was doing brain surgery in the hospital one week. The next week, I literally did not have the ability or strength or reserve, resilience. Ah, that word. Resilience to continue. I dropped out and literally moved in with my mother and uh, worked in a truck stop for a year. Wow and wondered if I would ever, ever get back to being a neurosurgeon. And thought of quitting, had self-destructive thoughts. Very, very bad, dark place, dark place. So I know what it is when people get there. People would say I was burned out. And I had no insight into how I got there. And I think the most important thing is the Buddhist awareness, mm. mindfulness, having insight into where you are on a daily basis. And what pulled me out was a, a banker who held the trucks, held, held the mortgage on the truck stop. I think he wanted to see if I'd be alive to pay off the mortgage, called me one day <laughs> and said, Hey Joe, let's go for a run. And I said, Ron, I can't walk. I'm overweight. I'm dysmic walking up a flight of steps that I found a pair of shoes, an old pair of scrubs. We went to the high school track in Wheeling, West Virginia. I made it around four times and I said, never again, I'm exhausted. But that night was the first night I slept in probably three or four months. Wow. A light bulb went off, so I went down the next day myself and I did a mile and a quarter, then a mile and a half, then two, then five, and then I was like Forrest Gump running <laughs> through Wheeling, West Virginia. And, um, uh, Without intentionally realizing I was self-medicating by elevating my endorphins. It was endorphins, okay, right. My endocannabinoids, my anandamide, and serotonin levels. Wait, exercise raises anandamides? I thought yes. just smoking did that. There was a yeah. company that yeah. was extracting it from tobacco and offering it as a supplement, which was helping yeah. people with chronic inflammation. Well, of course, the FDA shut them well, down. But you know, as you know, yeah. anandamide is from the Sanskrit word bliss. I had no idea that, that exercise did that. Okay, you just taught me something. Thank you. Well, the runner's high yeah. is probably a cannabinoid-related receptor Interesting. high with the endocannabinoid, mm -hmm. as well as dopamine and elevated serotonin. Yeah, some endorphin, right? But in the endorphins. But anyway, with that, I, I learned to swim and I learned to bike and I started doing triathlons all secondarily to self-medication. Now, now, we're gonna fast forward 40 years. I forgot to mention this at the beginning. How many Ironmans have you done? I've done eight uh, full Ironman. And when was the last one you did? Uh, three years ago. Actually, I did a half Ironman last year. Okay, so at 77, you did a half Ironman. All right, so I would say that exercise is working for you. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. It's, it's, and, but I do that not in a, in a 
a, a, a bragging way. No. It's a way, it becomes a way of life. And I could not function at the level I do without that for so many reasons. And basically the, the exercise led me to back to a spiritual foundation that I had lost on my path to quotes success. Mm-hmm. Uh, my work was que- very out of balance. So basically, I, what I discovered is a book that uh, said, draw a square. On one side, put your work. On the other, your family and social. On the bottom, spiritual and physical. And then in your mind, draw a line somewhat commensurate with how much effort or time you spend on each one of these. Now, I Dave, it. I hate to tell Wait, you this. this. was in your in your 40s you found this book? Yeah. Wow, it was called I Dare You is the name of that book, right? Yeah. Okay. If I had to draw your square today, yeah. it would be a flat line work. I do a lot of work, that's for sure. <laughs> no doubt about that. But you are attentive to your family. Yeah. And you, I suspect there's some... I don't know what your spiritual basis is, but you're a giving man. Oh yeah, I've I've done a lot of meditation, Tibet meditation with the masters, uh, EEG assisted neurofeedback that puts I you in that. spiritual states. Very powerful stuff. Yeah, I even have a facility that yeah. does that. So I'd love def- that. If, if without a spiritual practice, I, I couldn't run the level that I do. Yeah, so, or if I did, I'd hate my life. So the essence of the square, which yeah. is the book, is to balance the work, the family, the spiritual, yeah. and the physical. And every day I get up and I say, okay, how am I going to touch each one of these sides mm-hmm. to maintain it? And you, you have this in, in your book, Square One. And the, the reason I'm, I'm laughing is that going back, I guess I'm dating myself now. When did I do that? A, a long time ago, uh, 15 or so years ago, I was uh, doing my MBA at Wharton and you're dealing with a bad relationship at home and having made and lost $6 million, which is a highly traumatic experience. Uh, it's not that traumatic to make $6 million, but it's pretty traumatic to lose it all of a sudden. Uh, and a bunch of health stuff. And I had a college professor named uh, Dr. Stu Friedman, who's been on Bulletproof Radio, who had a, a book. He was one of the top 100 execs at Ford Motor Company. And his book, I think, was more of a, a hexagon or something, but it was, what do you do for your community? And it was measured just the way you put it uh, Joseph, uh, you said, how much energy do you put into it? Not necessarily time. Correct. And then you, what are you getting out of it? And, and it became very clear to me, oh, I'm putting a lot of energy into my career. And wait, when I had $6 million, I wasn't any happier than when I didn't. And I included some of that wisdom in, uh, in Game Changers, my new book that came out based on all these interviews on the podcast. But what kind of motivates me to do the podcast and part of what pisses me off, frankly, is that you had a book with this knowledge that was around 40 years ago, 35 years ago, right? And that was probably based on a book that was around 20 or 30 years before that. So this wisdom has been with us for a long time. In fact, uh, Dr. Barry Morglon, UCLA gastroenterologist surgeon who's been on the show, one of 12 living grandmasters of the tradition in Chinese medicine that protected the emperor of China and was the root of the Shaolin practice. He'll draw the same thing from the ancient Chinese things. It's thousands of years old. But so few people know this until, like you, they hit rock bottom and they pick up a book. So you wrote a book, uh, Square One, uh, to talk about your experience with this stuff. And tell me, how did you find that? Because if we can accelerate the way people go out and find this kind of wisdom that's been with us from our elders for a long time, but no one knows about it, it'll help them. So tell me, how did you find the book and how do you expect people to find Square One? Yeah, As you well know, and many of the listeners well know adversity sometimes is the bad the, yeah. is the best teacher. Yeah, that's we for sure. We avoid it. We don't want it. We don't want to experience it or go through it. But when we're when we're despondent and we don't have many choices, we reach out for different kinds of help mm-hmm. or different kinds of self abuse. Yeah, <laughs> drugs, uh, alcohol, etc. And basically, I picked up this book by William Danforth that was he was the founder of the Rolston Purina Company. And in the uh, early 1900s, 1920s or so, he wrote this book, I Dare You, and he said, I dare you to lead a balanced life. And he used this, this nomogram, this example. And when I was living at that truck stop, despondent, also my immune system was so suppressed, I had infectious hepatitis from from eating truck stop food. 
I'll do it. And <laughs> I, I'm lying in bed wondering, you know, is this the end? And I just fortuitously picked up this book that I kept around that I never read. And uh, I, I drew my square. My, actually, my, my son was with me at the time. And I said, okay, let's draw our squares. And for the first time, I had the visual of seeing that it was a straight line EKG. There was no family. There was no spirituality. And there was no physicality. And it was, it was insight. And this is what people on the road to success, you know, the like you were at, at one point mm -hmm. making six million dollars, graduate of Wharton, all the all the uh, 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 all the uh, stuff that doesn't make all you happy. the stuff <laughs> <laughs> that we like and we we covet. But really, you know, Chuck Knoll said it very well, the, the coach of the Steelers that I mentioned before, you know, he said football isn't complicated. You, you see the, all the diagrams and everything on the sports pages and on the TV. He says, it's very simple. It's about blocking and tackling. Life is not really that complicated when you get down to the very basics of what we're talking about, mm. work, family, spirituality, and physicality. You know, the, the four bedrocks, if you don't, if you don't have strength in, in those, you're, you're on a tangent and you're struggling. You can get by with one, but my axiom, my, my ac Maroon's axiom number one, if two are atrophic, you're seeing your psychiatrist, your rabbi, your minister, you're in trouble. So, it, and again, it's not complicated. It's simple. <laughs> I had no insight how I ended up in a truck stop. But it was my decisions that I made along the way and my, my incredible drive to, in quotes, be successful in the eyes of the world. It wasn't mm -hmm. my eyes. It was in the success of the world. And I realized that, wow, I was, I was way off. I got there, but I've, I, it was like you losing $6 million, I'm sure. Yeah, a wake up call. That was a wake up call for sure, and and just realizing, wow, you know, I've I, I have nothing that makes me happy right now, and and the money didn't do that anyway, and like you, you got to do something with that. Uh, so you learned to measure happiness on your own yardstick instead of on other people's yardsticks was one of the things that was important. I, I did, and I would I would add to that. You know, one of my favorite quotes is, "The purpose of life is a life of purpose." So you have to deeply go into your heart and brain and what is your purpose? You know, I'm blessed at this point that, you know, I, I enjoy just like you, just like this podcast, you know, we're going to touch some people out there that it might make a difference. We don't know for sure, but it might. The odds are high at this point, a couple hundred thousand people ought to listen to this and let's, let's hope at least one of them benefits greatly. <laughs> yeah. We'll, we'll never know. Yeah, we won't. But, uh, it's giving and yeah. it's, it's out, it's altruism. Hans Selye, you, you may have recalled mm -hmm. Hans Selye, the physiologist, fight or flight. Yeah, around stress, right. About stress. He, he really wrote the books on stress. He had a great essay that he wrote on out, altruistic egotism. Mm -hmm. Out, don't kid yourself that you do something totally altruistic. It feels good to help other people. It it's feels okay. good. <laughs> <laughs> and it feels good to help other people. And I, I'll just flat out say it. If it didn't feel good to help other people, if I didn't believe I was doing that, I don't have to do Bulletproof Radio. You know, Bulletproof is a profoundly successful company, even if I don't do this. I do this because I know it helps people because I like it and I think it makes me happier, right? And plus I get to chat with you and I get to meet all sorts of cool people. I get to, it, it's a pretty good gig, right? But without that altruistic component, the ROI for me personally wouldn't be there. Yeah, yeah. and that's the same for me. I'm, as you said, I'm in, uh, I, I'm in the fourth quarter. Yeah, there you go. And, uh, but I love every day what, I, what I'm doing, the opportunity to share some of the knowledge that I've gleaned over the years and, and pass it on. You know, I, we yeah. both, I, I see the bullets going by. I, I see my friends with this and with that and uh, the patients that I see with 
traumatic brain injuries, brain tumors, Alzheimer's. And, and it's going to happen to us, no doubt. We can't get out of here alive. But in the meantime, it's uh, carpe diem. It's grabbing the gusto as best you can. And one other thing, mm -hmm. you know, I, I complimented you earlier on, but what you're doing is so huge with your products. And this is not a, a sales talk, but what's it about? It's about brain function. Yeah. It's about maintaining uh, a healthy lifestyle. It's about resilience, which, which you talked about. And, and your products, the, the medium chain triglycerides, the ketogenic types of diets are all probably the most healthful things you can do for brain function, yes. cardiac function, eliminate diabetes. And you know, you've created this not with the idea of being the most successful man in the world. You did it because you were doing what you probably wanted to do for yourself. Yeah, I had to figure this stuff out because I weighed 300 pounds and my brain didn't work. It was kind of a little altruistic. I mean, not a little self-serving altruism there too. Yeah. But I, I got pissed off that no one told me this. Yeah. Uh, if they told me I was 20, like I wouldn't have had to be a size 46 inch waist. So you know, I'm a 33 now, which is what I should have been. Yeah. Like it's it's unjust yeah. that this information isn't out there. And so someone had to do well, it. Well, you know, what's the most common cause of blindness, amputations, and kidney transplantation? Diabetes. Diabetes. So, you know, 30 million people have diabetes. Another 30 million have type two diabetes or more. Mm -hmm. How do you, how do you control that with diet and with ketones and, and, yeah. and with the exercise? It's, uh, it's, it felt like a great mystery uh, five, 10 years ago, but after getting the principles down yeah. and doing, for me, writing books is one thing that makes me build frameworks and understand things really well. At this point, I mean, I, I was looking to um, rent a house uh, and the lady who was showing me the house weighed 400 pounds. And I said, you know, I've lost 100 pounds and it wasn't a judgmental sort of thing, but like, you know, I've been there and I just kind of mentioned it. She said, what do you do? I'm an author. And, and, and so I, I spent three minutes saying, you know, this is kind of how it works. Let me give you a copy of the book. I'll give you a little packet of brain octane and, you know, just, enjoy it and maybe learn something. And she mentioned, this is what made me bring this up. She said, you know, I had a, a brain injury. You know, I just started gaining weight after I got in this car accident. And I said, yeah, obesity is correlated with traumatic brain injuries. You have a brain thing going on. You can fix that. You need to go on a high fat diet. And she said, but I have all these cravings. I said, I just try this stuff. And she called us a week later and she said, I have lost 20 pounds. My energy is back. Like yeah. what? Just 20 pounds. Of yeah. course, that's inflammation. That's not all fat. But it, it's stuff like that. How is it possible that she's been walking around for almost 20 years with an extra 200 pounds of fat because no one, her doctor didn't tell her, no one told her? Like, that stuff makes me mad. Yeah, well, I mean, we, we can get into the, the medical profession and- Yeah, we don't have to rip on doctors. It's not doctor's fault. I mean, and, it's as and, much and all big that food as it is doctors. The, the things that drive doctors mad, the electronic medical record, the oh, yeah. hospital administration and expectations, the government, the rules, the paperwork, you know, and, and then putting doctors on time clocks. Yeah. How many patients you have to see a day because you're now 56% of doctors are hospital employees. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the accountants are di dictating to some degree what yeah. the activities of the doctors have to be in the time allotted. So it's that part of it, is another yeah. a time for another interview. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, th there's a short response to that. I mean, a piece of advice for people listening. I want to just gut check it with you. Uh, I like to recommend to friends and, and people listen. I say, look, if you're dying, bleeding, <laughs> broken, <laughs> or have a, an aggressive infection, you go to one of those doctors and they're going to save your life. And if you have something that's not working very well and you've been dealing with it for a while, you go to a doctor and you pay them cash pay and they don't take insurance because the people who work on that stuff, they get you better, but they're going to need two hours of your time and no insurer is going to pay for it. And it's not worth that doctor's time to talk to the insurer. And here at the A4M, there's tons of doctors who at least part of their practice, just they cut out the insurers, they cut out the accountants and they just do it. Is that good advice or bad no, advice? No, I, I think it's... it's it's, it's good advice. Um, it's unverified. The, the, the question is unverified, and the question is how practical. How do you find a doctor who yeah. is more 
interested in a holistic approach, yeah. which is what you're talking about. Yeah. You're talking about someone who's going to talk to you about lifestyle, about diet, about exercise, about the fundamentals of blocking and tackling to live well, mm -hmm. so to speak. And my problem with that, Dave, is always the doctor can tell you to do this, but how do you motivate people to do it when their lifestyle has been such for over many years. I, I Shows like this, I think yeah. showing where it can be done. I, and I, I go back to the comments that I've got from the people who've read my book. You know, I, I have a whole list, a file drawer of comments of, of how it's benefited them in various ways. How they've been able to see someone who was a failure a real abject failure and able to use very simple guidelines to get back to the best part of my life. You're that same way. How many pounds did you lose? A hundred. You lost a hundred pounds yep. and, and then came back to have, you know, a brain that is resilient and sharp and creative. Uh, so you know, a mentor, a guide, a, you know, someone that people can look up and say, hey, if he can do it, I can do it. I mean, that's, I think that's important. Yeah, some motivation and, and a sense of control is is important. And I, I do write all the blog posts on Bulletproof, all, all the things I do are around that frame where I, I truly don't believe that most people want to be healthy. Uh, most people want to be great. <laughs> they want so, a pill. Yeah. They, they want a pill to take, to well, lose weight and to feel good. We, and to we all, and it's normal. We all want the least yeah, the possible least, work least and least effort is, is good. Of course we want that, uh, but we don't want to put in the least or most effort to be healthy. We want to be least or most effort to be way better than that. And I think that was a, a part of the thought there. And I imagine that someone who walks into your office uh, who has had a TBI, if you were to ask them, hey, do you want to be just back to normal or do you want to be beyond that. Most people say, you know what, I'd like to be better than I was before. And it seems like today you can take someone who ate French fries, smoked, drank, hit their head, <laughs> and then uh, you get them to stop that stuff and you fix the stuff in their head and they're going to come out of it better than they were before. It, is that is that a reasonable thing? Oh, there's no question about it. You know, I, I go back to when we were on the Savannah in Africa and it was feast or famine. So during feasting, we would build up our fat, and uh, during famine, we would break the fat down into ketone bodies, which mm -hmm. is a much cleaner fuel for us to, to use. And also, I've noticed fasting. Yes. When you fast, what happens to your senses? You become much more sensual. You really do. You smell things, you taste things, you're you're more aware of things. Yeah. Why? It's an evolutionary thing. We were when we were on the savannah. If we didn't have a sensory input that told us where to get food, we'd die. So that evolutionary facility carries over. And once you experience that feeling good and thinking sharply, maybe you don't want to have that second or third glass of wine yeah. or, or, or those cigarettes because you know you don't want to feel like crap the next day. Right. And I want to feel good. So you have to want to feel better and function better. Yeah. It, and it's one of the most precious things. And I think for me, I probably never felt that good uh, because I grew up in a basement with toxic mold and I ate frankly garbage, but we didn't know. We were, trying, we were doing our best. It was the 80s. What did we know? <laughs> Squeeze margarine was supposed to be good for you. And so I was constantly neurologically inflamed. Uh, and then I, I had a few experiences. Like, Why? You know, I'd like to feel like this more often. And, and you just get that one little spark. And that's why Bulletproof Coffee was the first thing I blogged about. Because even when I had chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, I, could, I could do that with the brain octane lining all the stuff up right. And I'm like, wow, today's a pretty good day, even though I was feeling really bad. It's maybe not as good as it could be, but it was way better. And it was about that little spark. So I want to be able to take people who are you know, really kind of running at a three out of 10 and say, you know, maybe you can get up to seven out of 10 and just feel that and set that as your new bar, right? Not even knowing that there's more numbers that are higher. And uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that that's available for almost everyone. I mean, you've got way more experience looking at brains than I do 
Is that goal feasible? I mean, it, can, can we get most people to reset their expectation about the good they can feel without even knowing that there's betterness out there? Well, you know, I did that with exercise. I can't over, you know, the best antidepressant, it's not SSRIs, it's physical activity, it's aerobic activity. And this has been shown in innumerable studies, uh, head-to-head studies with exercise versus drugs. It's more effective, lasts longer, doesn't affect libido, and uh, and and you feel better, and that's basically what happened to me. I walked around that track four times, and then I did it six times, and eight times, and pretty soon, unintentionally, I didn't make a choice. I'm going to start working out. I felt better each day, and I realized that I was getting healthier. My brain and body were getting back into balance. So I would tell somebody who's depressed, I would say. Definitely do your 10,000 steps a day. Start with 5,000 mm-hmm. and gradually increase. Don't worry about getting healthy. Don't worry about getting better. Just do it and good things will happen as a secondary effect. Uh, that is, is profound advice. You do that and uh, I would maybe add, I want to get your advice on this, reducing your exposure to bright lights at night so you can sleep better. I mean, I started a glasses company because of that problem uh, and for depression, it seems like circadian disruption is a massive thing. And you have that in combination with a lack of exercise or with a TBI. And, and it's just, just bad news. How dialed in are you at this point in your career? How important is the circadian mismatch, the bright lights at night, the screens it's, and all I, that? I think it's very important. And that's, you know, what's the last thing most people do before they turn out their light? They check their cell phone yeah. or their tablet, their iPad. And, uh, and, and I think these are all things that can disrupt the circadian rhythm. You know, things like melatonin, I think, do help, uh, particularly in the older patients. Yeah. Uh, it's anti-inflammatory. You're probably not getting enough of it. So Exactly. And in particular, and also the vitamin D levels in uh, temperate climates in the winter, you know, season, seasonal affective disorder is a very disruptive thing due to the circadian rhythms, due to light. And, uh, and, and I think the, the lights with the optimum, uh, uh, frequency, Mm -hmm. uh, are very helpful. I recommend these to patients. I love it that you're recommending that. And that got a lot of resistance for a while. And we've got a, in fact, I'm presenting it tomorrow morning, um, an EEG, uh, scan of a person, uh, under LED lighting, they put on the glasses for sleep that True Dark, my company manufactures. It, they've got four layers of optical filters that cut out narrow frequencies of light that we know affect the SCN in the brain. And with the True Dark glasses on, you can see a drop in beta, a <laughs> rise in alpha. And it's like meditation just from the color of the light, right? And that's uh, with these glasses using an aura ring, I, I can double my deep sleep. And if I wear them for an hour or two before bed, you have to wear them for an hour. And the brain thinks it's midnight. But this is like a drug-like effect. I mean, it's it's pretty yeah. potent stuff. And you're saying, what if you just had a dimmer switch and you didn't look at your phone? But when someone's really depressed, you're much more likely to look at your phone or play some video games late at night. And I think it makes depression worse. And then, of course, you're not going to go exercise, to your point. And, and you get sort of stuck in this spinning cycle of just nothing works. But I I want to add some real strong value for people listening. And and let's go back and talk about traumatic brain injuries. And I'd like to share the stuff that I have been talking with some pro athletes who asked me for my opinions about what would you do before, uh, before getting hit in the head, just in case it happens. And I want you to shoot them down and tell me what's missing. And you can do this because A, it's Bulletproof Radio, you're not treating a patient, and it's okay to hypothesize and say, we don't have science on this, but that seems like a really good idea. And you know, like, like your mileage may vary, talk with your people. So it, you know, it's okay to go out on a limb, just tell us if you're on a limb. So I, you're an expert in the field, I'm not asking you to make up anything. You good with that? Okay, all right. All right. So I've looked at uh, you know, ischemia in, in the brain, and What happens when you get hit? There's a big mitochondrial amount of swelling. You keep the mitochondria working really, really well, you get less swelling. And I found a bunch of studies about that. So what I 
what I did after I got hit in the head and what I would would propose is a good idea beforehand is you take the things that we know make mitochondria work with better efficiency so that when you get hit, if you do get hit, your mitochondria are less likely to swell up and die. <laughs> like, it's not rocket science. We're talking things like coenzyme Q10, uh, probably turmeric, uh, although that doesn't have a direct mitochondrial effect, but it, it can have other effects on, on water chemistry that are beneficial. You'd wanna have some omega-3s, but not too many, because well, we might be concerned about bleeding. Uh, and you'd wanna have things like uh, oxaloacetate, which we put in, in Keto Prime. In fact, I'd say Bulletproof is the company that, that put that on the map, which is the last step of the Krebs cycle before it starts again, so you get a, a more effective Krebs cycle. Uh, you'd want to have uh, things like PQQ, and uh, that's something we put in unfair advantage. PQQ is another thing that's shown in multiple studies to make mitochondria work better. And you stack up L-carnitine and D-ribose, which I put in some other products, and you end up with everything you can find that pokes the Krebs cycle to make it an effortless Krebs cycle. You do that and you put in a few anti-inflammatory herbs like the turmeric, you say, you know what, if you're gonna go out and if you did get hit in the head and your mitochondria are able to withstand what would cause swelling and mitochondrial death over time, you're probably gonna be better off than if you hadn't done it. Good idea, bad idea. I'm smiling, Dave, because if you look at the things that I take every day. <laughs> Me too. I take all those every day myself. <laughs> every day. I take every one of those. Oh yeah, plus a couple of hands full of blueberries and and walnuts. And in fact, I take blueberry polyphenols. We make polyphenols like three or yeah, three grams of polyphenols uh, per day. Just there. just huge, huge. And and why do I do it? Not just because of concussions, but I do it because those the the same things you said. It, it's the essence of neurodegeneration. Yeah, it's the essence of brain rot, so to speak. And. So, and, and my, honestly, it's amazing how kindred we are in this, <laughs> yeah. uh, because I believe that most of the diseases that affect the brain are mitochondrial, the diseases of mitochondria. Yes, it's energy. Last, my last book, that was the whole hypothesis, it's, yes. It's energy, and if you're not making ATP, how do you make ATP? How do you reduce the re reactive oxy oxygen species yeah. and the free radicals by getting clean fuel? Yes. Which is, which again, with ketones, mm -hmm. you know, there's less debris. Yeah, there's your brain octane, right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I, I fully subscribe to this. In fact, when I see patients who have intract, who have post-concussion syndrome, yeah. I have a sheet, honestly, that lists almost every one of those, plus resveratrol. Yes, that would be on there. I do, I do add resveratrol to yeah. this. And I, I- Put that in polyphenomenal, right? I, I, I give it to the family and I say, these are the things that I would suggest you consider. What do you think about fisetin? You, you ever play with that That one? No. It's, it's an unusual uh, polyphenol that's found in strawberries and seaweed. Okay. I All put right. it in smart mode, our, our nootropic stack, uh -huh. and it's, it's a synolytic. It gets rid of dead brain cells, but it has really good effects on cognitive enhancement as well. And I, I think it's one of those up and coming ingredients mm -hmm. um, that I was thinking might be somewhere in your stack, but. I'm very, very, Cognizant of curcumin yeah. and, and turmeric. Mm -hmm. I think this is a powerful agent. And you know there are hundreds of studies ongoing and have been ongoing with as an anti-neoplastic agent. Mm -hmm. And also um, anti-neurodegenerative. In, in the Indian population, epidemiological studies have shown that those who eat a, a lot, the Indian population yeah. have a lesser degree of Alzheimer's disease mm -hmm. than others, and it's thought to be related to the curcumin in their diet. I, I believe it, and there's absorption and, and things like that. Yeah. Yeah, uh, tell me about absorption. You're using curcumin. Are you using yeah. liposomes, nano particles? How do you get the most absorption? Well, you can certainly use uh, liposomes, and I do that in some products. With the turmeric, we make something called Curcumin Max, and it's got a, a standardized form of turmeric that's shown in multiple studies to absorb better. It's called a BCM95, if I'm remembering uh, correctly. Um, and it's a standardized amount of oil in there. And yep. it, okay. that, sort of, that sort of turmeric rivals liposomes in some studies. And what I'm talking about here, if you're going, what the heck are you talking about rivaling liposomes, Dave? <laughs> what, what I'm talking about here is, is it's not enough to say I took a supplement because if the supplement, if you poop it out, you just wasted money. So you're better off to take less of a supplement that costs more that gets in than you want to take a cheap supplement that doesn't do anything. 
And so what I did is I, I put inside a gel cap that has brain octane because brain octane is something the body loves and it actually can help absorption of anything that's fat soluble. And uh, Gerald Pollack, a guy who wrote a book on uh, water chemistry from the University of Washington called The Fourth Phase of Water and figured out that the first thing your mitochondria do is they change the structure of water using 1200 nanometer light called heat. And they make the water more viscous at, uh, at a membrane of a cell, which allows things like cell folding uh, to have, or sorry, like protein folding to happen better. And he showed in his labs, we funded some of the research that did this. Uh, and this is not research of uh, like products, this is core water biochemistry stuff. And he found that you can get a very large exclusion zone. So a higher fraction of the water is biologically useful water that doesn't require conversion. And turmeric and things like ghee <laughs> are things from Ayurveda sure. that change water chemistry. And we know if you're going to make ATP, you've got to have exclusions on water in the cells. We know that the Tibetans now, the reason they're, at least the reason I believe they're putting their butter in their tea and churning it, mm -hmm. even though there's no electricity, it wouldn't be better eat the butter, drink the tea. They never do that because it doesn't work because you have to have those water, basically small droplets of fat. So what we're doing in Curcumin Max is we're saying, all right, let's take advantage of the fact that brain octane is one of those weird water dispersible oils and it has turmeric in it. And we put some weird herbs from China called Stefania root in that also are shown in studies to work on unusual inflammatory cytokines. So the deal is how do we get it in there? What doesn't work, what scares me is black pepper extract. And there are many people who say, oh, well, you know, I saw this study that says black pepper raises the levels by 4,000% in the blood. Here's the problem. That pokes holes in your gut lining. Black pepper. <laughs> yeah, well, not just eating black pepper, but, but the extract. So what else are you going to be getting 4,000 times more of? Pretty much everything. So the black pepper stuff, I've, I noticed this as I was evolving my own practice over years. Every time I take a black pepper turmeric, I say, this is supposed to be so good, but after a while, it just didn't work right. So I think that can be one of those things where, you know, you need to drive absorption of what you're taking, not absorption of other things. So I, I'm a little skeptical of that. And when you go to the juice bar and they say, I put black pepper in with my turmeric, come on. There's not enough black pepper. The studies are on extract, which is a pound of black pepper's worth of extract. It, you know, a little sprinkle of black pepper in your turmeric. If you like it, do that, but it's not going to change things. Kind of a long answer, sorry, but I really no, care about it. No, this but I, I mean, with the, with the uh, turmeric, some people I know use olive oil. They'll, they'll, yeah, that's they'll, a good way. They'll take the capsule, open the capsule, put it in a spoon, a little of olive oil, and then a little black pepper. Yeah. The black pepper is there. It's a, it's a placebo, I would say. Uh, but to enhance absorption. The olive oil, the any olive oil, oil is going to do it. Yeah. 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 Right. Uh, what do you do with turmeric? I take nano. Yeah. There, there's good science behind nanoparticles. Yeah. Nanoparticles? Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Anything that's water soluble tends to have very different effects on the body than things that are fat soluble and your cells are made out of fat. So sometimes having yeah. both is good. All right, let's talk about what you do after a brain hit. So I, I took a, a titanium knee to the head at high speed uh, at Burning Man. <laughs> uh, so it was an accident, it was all in good fun. And fortunately I'm in a camp full of anti-aging and functional medicine doctors. And uh, right away, we pooled all the fish oil that was in the camp. So I took very high dose omega-3 fish oil. I took 10 of the unfair advantage uh, ampules that uh, fortunately I manufacture. And these are full of PQQ in a liposomal form. So it's lip liposomes with CoQ10, hundreds of milligrams of CoQ10. I took uh, one friend's progesterone. Uh, and I believe that was an oral progesterone, if I remember right. And then we took a bunch of the keto prime, which is the bulletproof oxaloacetate, and some turmeric and whatever else I could find around the camp. That's all I can remember right now. It's a bit fuzzy, but I mean, I took a lot of this stuff and then we used a cold laser uh, on my head. So this was, was the protocol. I did this for about a week of that same general stack, including progesterone. I, I used it orally instead of topically uh, and maybe 20 grams of omega threes a day. And this is from fish, like the real omega threes, not the vegetarian vegetable omega threes. What was I missing from that protocol? <laughs> I don't think you were missing anything, but you were you were incredibly innovative and creative in what you what you did because ninety nine percent of concussions, a great majority of concussions, at least that I've observed, are treated with none of those. the The treatment is 
uh, you know, the saying, the, uh, to amuse the patient until nature cures him. Mm-hmm. We're depending on the, the physiological properties of our own bodies to get us back into homeostasis. Right. None of the adjuncts you're talking about are used in any significant way. Yeah. By they, anybody. They're not standard. And I just said, this is an emergency. It just happened. I have to do something. Yeah. And you know, I have leaders of functional medicine all around me. Like, I'm going to go for it because I got yeah. nothing to lose. I yeah. know it's going to hurt. Yeah. <laughs> but but if you were a football player yeah. and you got hit in the head or a hockey player, and I've talked to lots of them over the years, uh, not nearly as many as you, but you know, sometimes they call uh, some of the innovative ones. I mean, if if you if you knew that someone was going to be hit in the head and they knew they had a good risk of it, would you have that on the sidelines if you could? No, let me put it, let me put it this way. There, there's quite a few studies. One of my associates who was in the movie, Julian Bales, is a neurosurgeon at North Shore in Chicago, mm-hmm. in the University of Chicago, has done quite a few studies and experimentally pre-treating animals. And not yeah. only he, but others have. It's such a good idea. With preloading the... Uh, the athletes with omega-3 fatty acids. And it clearly experimentally reduces the effects of a gra- of a consistent graduated hit. Okay. Ketones would do the same thing. I'm assuming you give them some brain octane, the ketones go up, they're gonna have less of an effect? Yes, okay. I, I believe it would do the All same right. thing. So, and I believe that omega-3 fatty acids, fish oil, omega-3s are pr- somewhat preventive or may ameliorate the sequela of the concussions mm-hmm. very clearly and when i have patients who do have concussions i i really recommend as we discuss many of the things you have yeah, okay. but are there randomized controlled placebo studies out there that says this is the thing to do what you and i are doing are extrapolating yeah. from our knowledge about neuroinflammation about trauma and about various agents that enhance mitochondrial function and then saying, hey, it makes sense, and there's no downside. It's the no downside that got me excited. <laughs> there's no downside. Okay. So I, some people would criticize both of us for mm-hmm. what we're saying, but I feel strongly that this is what, you know, I do to people what I do to myself or my own family. Amen. And That should and be the Hippocratic Oath, not the first do no harm. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is how I practice, and I've always, what would I do if I were on that table or yeah. I have this problem and, 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 and that's how I, how I work. And I, 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 these are the things we're talking, we're being very open and candid with your audience. There's no question about it. Well, well, thank you for sharing that. And I know as a, as a medical doctor, it, it's not always possible to say, you know, the harm is low. It probably is going to work. I would do it to myself and I'm not recommending you do it to you. Um, but thank you for going out on a limb a little bit there to say that. And I want to add just a ton of value for people listening. And um, you've heard a few of those recommendations before. I'll put these in the show notes for you. But this is the stuff that you might want to do before you go out mountain biking this weekend. And it's the stuff that if you fall and hit your head, you might consider. But talk to your doctor first. That's okay, too, if your doctor knows about any of this stuff. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. Given that we are at the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine, which gave us this wonderful opportunity to sit down and, and talk, I'm asking a different question than I normally ask on Bulletproof Radio. How long do you think you'll live? I, I, I'm really asking people who are leaders in the field. Yeah. How long do you think you can do it? Did I live? Yeah. I don't give it any thought. Mm. You know, I there there after after. D- Six Cent Mihaly, the psychologist who mm-hmm. wrote the book Flow, yeah, he said, the greatest moments of our lives are when our mind or our body is stretched to its limits mm-hmm. and the voluntary pursuit has to be voluntary yeah. of something both difficult and worthwhile. <laughs> Great quote. You know, and after one of the triathlons I did in Hawaii, I, I, I went into a seclusion and just thought, you know, why am I doing this? What's it all about, Alfie? Where am I going? And I came up with three most important things in life. Number one, a healthy mind and a healthy body. Mm-hmm. Mensana incorporates sano. The Romans said it very well. Number two is relationships. Relationships with God, family, and friends. 
And number three is carpe diem. Mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> I, I just, as I said earlier, I see too many people coming down with terrible diseases my age, my friends dropping off. So I look at every day as a gift. And what can I do today? Somerset Maugham, the, the writer, early part of the 19th century, wrote a little book towards the end of his life entitled The Summing Up. Mm -hmm. And he looked back over his life and he said, you know, what's, what's really, really important that I've done and the summing up of my life? And one sentence in particular stood out. He said, the meaning of life lies in what one wills to create. The meaning is in creativity, whether you're an artist, uh, an athlete, a doctor, whatever you are, you have the ability to create on a daily basis. I'm very blessed with what I'm able to do at my age. So every day I say carpe diem, and when that bullet hits, I've had a good ride. So, so you're happy with as many as you can get that you like. <laughs> All right, that, that's a good answer. And it's different than I've heard from others at, at A4M. I mean, a lot of people name numbers, and uh, I've certainly named a number. And I say, look, I think, I think 180 is achievable. And it's because I know I've seen someone do 120. So with the stuff that we know, maybe I could get there. It seems like I have a better chance than not. Yeah. So I'll, I'll bet on 120, and I'm betting a little bit of technology over the next 75 years is going to help out. Dave, the, I, I, I don't want to disagree with you in any no, no, way. It's okay but, to disagree. Tell me I'm crazy. I love that. But just let me just tell you that you know my goal, yeah. as I tell people, I want to die young. There you go. As late as possible. Yeah. That's, that's the goal. I want to die young as yeah. late as possible. It, there's no point in making it to 180 if you're hanging on. If by you're a hanging on, incontinent, uh, demented. Un uninterested. And, and in yeah. pain. And there's no value in that. I like to say uh, my plan is to die uh, by a method and at a time of my choosing. I like that. <laughs> I, I, I concur with yeah. that 100%. Yeah. And hopefully... Uh, that'll be uh, 180 or after, or maybe it'll be sooner if that's what I want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Dr. Maroon, thank you for, for the work you've done in your life, uh, just really studying what's going on inside our heads, especially when they get hit and things have shifted from being a bit of a, a, of a black box model into we know so much more about what's going on. We can measure the effect on how, how your brain responds You've driven the development of that test. And your book, Square One, is, is actually a profound read that's very uh, very different than, than you might expect. But you're saying, you know, I've picked up a little bit of knowledge in my almost 80 years uh, <laughs> and having faced some big things and done some big things. So you're a classical example of, of what I call a game changer, someone who's, who's done enough things and had a big enough impact to come on the show and share both you know, what your, your work is about, but also how you got there. So thanks for a fantastic interview. Really enjoyed getting to spend time with you. Well, it's my pleasure, Dave. And I applaud you the same way for your, as I said in the book and wrote in the book, your many accomplishments and your, your zeal in helping others. Oh, thank you. If you liked today's episode, you know what I'm going to tell you to do. I'm going to say, go to Amazon, pick up a copy of Square One by Dr. Maroon, spelled like the color, and while you're at it, pick up your copy or your second copy of Game Changers. And that's going to do a couple things. It's going to give you two awesome books to read. It's also going to make those two books show up together for the next person who wants to buy one of them on Amazon, which is always good. I'm only going to recommend stuff to you that I think is worth your time to read. And certainly I'm only going to write stuff for you that's worth your time to read. So definitely Square One meets that goal for you. Have a beautiful day.